your take on this push to get rid of the guy? It's been going on a while. Uh, the administration has quickly turned around the fact, yeah, but, you know, the, the migrants entering the United States have gone down dramatically now. Uh, things are going our way. Nothing's going to happen to the guy. So where is this going? Well, I think uh, where it's going is not impeachment. Only one cabinet member has ever been impeached. Uh, that was a little bit before my time. It was in the Grant administration. Um, I don't think that's going to happen because Republicans don't have the votes. Remember, they have a slim majority in the House. So there have been a number of bills that would impeach Mayorkas. I think it's more likely that Republicans eventually, after uh, setting uh, the groundwork and doing uh, some hearings, I think maybe a no-confidence vote. Uh, Senator Roger uh, Marshall in the Senate has introduced such a, a measure, and maybe that t takes a, could be a compromise uh, in the House, Neil. You know, um, oftentimes you talk about it's very tough to impeach a cabinet member. Uh, not so tough to force them to resign, though, especially when they become more trouble than they're worth for their boss, the president. I think of Burt Lands, who, you know, got rid of, uh, you know, was Jimmy Carter's uh, budget guy, uh, who, with all of his financial and other issues, uh, was forced to resign. Uh, Ray Donovan and the Reagan administration as labor secretary against charges that we later learned to find out were, were way overdone. He was exonerated on all accounts, famously said, how do I get my good name back now? But, but, uh, but in other words, it's usually done that way. Now, in the Trump administration, there were many who came through what seemed a revolving door among cabinet officials who, you know, had the president's favor at one moment and didn't the next, and they were gone. But it's hard to force them out as an outside player, right? It is. And once you have members of your own team, so let's say if you had a number of Democrats saying that Mayorka should resign, then, then he would be in real trouble. But right now, he has a president's confidence. At the same time, Neil, when you look at border politics, I mean, this is an issue that is not, uh, does not play to the president's strength. It's something that could cost him a second term. So uh, let's see where, uh, you know, what people think of Mayorkas in a year. But right now, I expect him to stay on, but he's going to be grilled repeatedly uh, throughout this year and into next. You know, and ironically, what things might be looking a tad better at the border right now, that's what the administration is crowing about. But the fact of the matter is it's coming into Americans' everyday lives, given the migrants who have made their way into New York and really stretched resources thin, uh, where Eric Adams, the mayor, has been shipping a lot of these migrants to points north, even in, in cities that want nothing to do with them. But again, it's it, that's what has been seeing a big uptick, and that has actually brought it into more Americans' communities. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think de Democrats in the White House should be very careful about crowing about anything about the border. I, I, I think it's uh, risky politics when you're crowing about the stock market or the border that can change uh, very quickly. So, you know, this is something that is, you know, Mayorkas has been very combative uh, with Republicans. But you mentioned Eric Adams, and that's one to watch. Eric Adams and the White House on the border in particular have not gotten along. Uh, and, and those are the Democrats to watch as far as what they say about Mayorkas and his leadership. And it's no coincidence, Neil, that after Republicans won the House, well, then President Biden went to the border. Uh, that was not just something that was planned. It was planned after uh, Republicans uh, got the Speaker's gavel. I'm curious what you make of this trip on the part of the president now to Philadelphia. That's the kickoff to his campaign. Uh, he announced, I think, more than 53 days ago. Now going to Philadelphia, uh, this early endorsement of the AFL-CIO, that's not a shocker or a fox alert that the AFL-CIO is backing the Democratic candidate, but it is the earliest. They have a lot of resources, a lot of money. Uh, they did the last go-round and the go-round before that. And what, what do you make of this? Well, you know, getting the endorsement for a Democrat, uh, as you mentioned, Neil, from the AFL-CIO uh, executives, well, that's not, that's not hard. Getting the support of a good, overwhelming majority of their rank and file, that's what Democrats have to worry about. That's where Republicans, and in particular former President Trump, has uh, attracted a lot of blue-collar votes. So that's where unions have to be concerned. Yes, they're going to endorse Biden. But are they going to get their troops out to support him as much as uh, unions supported prior Democrats? There's no doubt AFL-CIO, and they have uh, praised Biden, said he's the best uh, president they've ever worked with. Uh, but that remains to be seen. Um, it seems to be a, a wasted effort on the part of those who are pushing the president to, to debate. Uh, no president worth his salt is going to risk doing that with some of these challengers to him, uh, beginning with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Marion Williamson, et cetera. Uh, 
What do you make of that? I mean, you hear this call, debate, debate, debate. But, you know, I, I heard the same thing with Ted Kennedy, his forces in 1980 with Jimmy Carter, uh, with Gerald Ford, the incumbent president, with uh, Ronald Reagan challenging him in 1976. It never comes to pass. Yeah, I, I don't think uh, President Biden is going to be debating RFK Jr., Marianne Williamson. At, at the same time, Neil, there's this uh, big debate in the Democratic Party of what, what state should go first. And of course